all and welcome back to my Dark Seed 2 guide read. The guide is of course by Leanne Morris. Today I'm going to cover Chapter 5, Fighting City Hall. Quick note before I get started, I was asked to identify when I'm adding my own commentary to what I'm reading. I decided to add my logo as a visual indicator for when I'm cracking jokes or going off script. Let's get started. The Civic Center, an ugly building, houses a lot of ugly business. Three offices are lined up side by side, morgue, court, and sheriff. Mike says that the town joke is first they tie him, then they try him, then they fry him. That's another one for the Chamber of Commerce recruitment ads. A payphone is located off to the left. Mike tries to make a call, but he doesn't have any change. The door to the courtroom is locked, but Mike can enter either the morgue or the sheriff's office. Sheriff Butler's office. Mike says the jail reminds him of Mayberry, and he's not far off. There's a jail cell along the right-hand wall, but neither Otis nor anyone else is in sight. The file cabinet is along the wall, along with a row of rifles. Both are locked up tight, and Mike's sure not going to be able to get inside while the sheriff is sitting right there reading a girly magazine. Mike tells the sheriff that he's just getting out of the heat. Sheriff Butler greets him with that hearty glad to see a tone that should instantly put Mike on guard. He continues to badger Mike, asking him if he's there to confess and telling him that killers often follow the investigation of their crimes. But Mike's their own business, and as soon as he's able to, he begins his own investigation. How well did you know Rita? he asks. Sheriff Butler doesn't deny having dated Rita. Like Mike, he says Rita was too busy with her reading group that he dumped her. She had tried to get him to join the group too, but evidently he's uninterested in reading material that doesn't include a centerfold, and he might not be able to read, just throwing that out there. Mike also questions the sheriff about Hank's rumor that Rita's body was found in less than perfect shape. The policeman is upset that the body was moved so quickly because it messed up the crime scene. Doc Larson's one strange guy, he confides to Mike. Evidently, the good doctor was fired from a hospital for becoming a little too close to some of his deceased patients. He's none too pleased when Mike asks him why he was fired from the Dallas police force. He left of his own accord, Sheriff Butler insists, to leave the city stress behind and get some peace and quiet. In that case, Mike asks, why don't you do anything about Jimmy? The sheriff just blusters. Although he leaves without searching the contents of the sheriff's desk or filing cabinet, Mike finds out that Sheriff Butler, like Deputy Brown, will leave his post only in an emergency. He also discovers that there was no sign of struggle at the crime scene. Rita must have known the killer. Of course, Rita seems to have been on intimate terms with a great many people in town. Damn. <laughs> Alright, uh, the morgue. Mike gets quite a reception in the reception room of the morgue. The medical examiner is going at it hot and heavy with someone behind the pebble glass of the secretary's chamber. And that's not even the strangest thing. First of all, what's a morgue doing with a waiting room, especially one with a stack of magazines and a ticket dispenser? Crowley probably has its share of unhappy people, but they're probably not lining up to wait to be autopsied. The TV is a nice touch, but a serial killer is being interviewed, hardly appetizing, just the calming influence a town needs when there's a mad killer on the loose. An electronic lock on the door to the morgue laboratory remains stubbornly shut no matter what Mike tries. Maybe he can sweet-talk his way inside. When Mike taps on the glass, the clandestine couple hastily disentangles and Doc Larson opens the window. He doesn't fit his Lothario reputation. He's pudgy with thin blonde hair and a nasty expression. The pickings sure are slim for the women of Crowley. Using a flimsy excuse about being busy with a patient, Doc Larson is anything but suave. He blows up if Mike asks him whether he was making out so tread carefully and soothe his enormous ego. The doctor apparently treats living patients on the side to supplement his income. Although Doc Larson won't let Mike read Rita's autopsy report, he admits rather gleefully that it was a particularly gruesome death. No, he barely knew Rita. She was aiding him with DNA experiments that were sure to get him out of Crowley and into a cushy university job. Now for the bombshell. 
didn't the doctor work for a hospital until he was fired for indecent liberties? This accusation infuriates the doctor to such an extent that he slams his fist down on the counter. He accidentally opened the electronic lock. Doc Larson evidently goes elsewhere in the building to work off his frustration, or maybe to find the woman he was with earlier and work off his frustrations. Mike doesn't have a lot of time, but he doesn't want to spend a lot of time in the morgue anyway. At least one person won't be walking out of the morgue. A body is lying on a gurney in the middle of the floor. A file cabinet is along the left-hand wall, and the refrigerated compartments where bodies are stored line the right-hand wall. Test tubes and other scientific paraphernalia cover a table. That's probably where Doc Larson runs the DNA experiments he claims will get him out of this backwater town. Macabre curiosity draws Mike first to the body compartments. He finds Rita in the first one he opens. Most of Rita, anyway. Her head is missing. To make sure Doc Larson isn't using the noggin for some other purpose, Mike checks out the autopsy report from the file cabinet. Ick. Not only was Rita's head cut off with a serrated knife, but her tongue and eyes were gouged out and left at the crime scene. The file cabinet also reveals an autopsy for the slab man. His name was Mark Danson, and he was an old lighthouse keeper who walked with a cane. Surprisingly, he died of old age, a rarity lately in Crowley. An envelope from someone named Minnie at the carnival was addressed to Mark, but the envelope is empty. Hidden among the rest of the files is one other item, Doc Larson's little black book. It's filled with names, and, like a 60s playboy, he's rated them with stars. Rita got four stars, proving once and for all that librarians do their research. Jimmy's name and phone number are also included in the book. He got six stars. <laughs> I'm just kidding about that part. The stars, that is. Jimmy's name is actually in the book. Before he leaves, Mike glances at the dearly departed. The old lighthouse keeper has a glass charm around his neck. Mike considers taking it, but realizes that the man had wanted to be buried with it. What do you have to say for yourself? Mike could use a little fun to spice up this trying day, so it's time to head to the carnival. But before he risks his life and limb on the tilt-a-whirl, he should check back with the townspeople to see if anyone has turned up new leads or rumors. Ma Dawson is her usual loving self, refusing to talk about Rita. Paul Cooper and Deputy Brown have nothing new to say, neither does Hank. Mrs. Ramirez shares a few details about her husband's death. The insurance company didn't want to pay. But Sheriff Butler investigated the fire and couldn't find evidence of foul play. Mrs. Ramirez is none too fond of Rita. She calls her the Whore of Babylon and accuses her of trying to steal her husband and corrupting the entire town. Jimmy, too, really goes on the defensive when Mike tells him about the little black book. He says his name is in the book because he used to procure women for the medical examiner and that Rita came onto the doctor, not the other way around. It looks like Rita was a quote-unquote pro who used her own methods to augment her regular paycheck. Melissa is cold as usual, puffing on a cigarette. In his alley shack, Slim tells you he's worried about crop circles near Mayor Fleming's farm, and he has linked Rita's killing to files about JFK and the library. So in this chapter, we've added Doc Larson's black book to Mike's inventory, and we've met Doc Larson. So let me go back and read the captions with the pictures. All right, the first one is with the phone booth, it looks like. Actually, I guess it's just about the mayor. The mayor's not hanging around the Civic Center, at least not yet. Visit the sheriff and the medical examiner in the meantime. We will certainly do that. All right, moving on. Uh, the sheriff's office is so familiar that you'd almost expect Barney or Opie to come charging through the door. I'm sure they'd do that if they had the budget. All right, next one. Most people would find that making out in a morgue cramped their style. That's not the case with Doc Larson. Let's see. I think this is the last one. Yes, the last one. It's a good thing Mike didn't have any breakfast. He might have lost it when faced with the pleasantries of the morgue. And that's it. That was actually kind of a short chapter. Let me actually make sure that I didn't skip any pages. Uh, it does not look like I did. Okay, cool. So, I hope you guys found that interesting. Tune in next time for Chapter 6. As always, 
Thank you for watching. Hey y'all, a beta version demo of my game, Tales of Hyperia the Crimson Knight, is available to play over at my itch.io page. The link is down in the description. The final demo version is set to release by the end of the year, and will see massive improvements and upscaling. Make sure you stay tuned for updates.